Good evening, everyone. Happy Wednesday evening. Welcome to Insight, our literary program that we're able to bring to you in partnership with Vancouver Public Library and Vancouver Writers Fest. My name is Amber Ritchie. I'm a librarian with VPL, and I am happy to be here this evening welcoming you to this event. And I would like to start things off by, on behalf of Vancouver Public Library and our partners, Vancouver Writers Fest, acknowledging the land that the majority of this program is taking place on tonight, the VPL locations and the Writers Fest locations are on unceded homelands of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh nations. And we would like to acknowledge that and to thank these nations for taking care of the land for so long so that we can be on it this evening. Before the rest of the evening starts off, I want to tell you about an upcoming library event. If after tonight and you have a great time, you will have a great time listening to these amazing mothers talk about what it's like to be them, you can then join the library tomorrow night to hear about another group of amazing people. The event is called Black Legends, Cowboys and Ranchers in Western Canada. And the event will feature Cheryl Fogo, who is a filmmaker, and Bertrand Bickersteth, a writer. And they will talk about the film that I hope many of you saw during Writers' Fest and, um, sorry, Film Fest and all the other streaming platforms, John Ware Reclaimed. So this event tomorrow, we'll talk about the, uh, the legacy of Black cowboys and ranchers in Western Canada. You can get more information about that on the VPL website. So just go to vpl.ca, get information on the time and how to view it and all the other things that are going on. Now, I would like to turn things over to Leslie Hertig, Artistic Director of the Vancouver Writers' Fest. Hi, Leslie. Hi, Amber. Thank you so much. Good evening and welcome to our seventh Insight event of 2022, presented in partnership with the Vancouver Public Library and TELUS. We are so glad that you could join us here this evening and thrilled to be presenting Good Mum on Paper, Writers on Creativity and Motherhood, hosted by one of the book's editors, Jen Suk Fung Lee, and featuring another of the editors, Stacey May Fowles, along with Yonina Curtin and Kelly Nan. I'd like to take a moment to appreciate our event partners this evening. Again, the Vancouver Public Library and TELUS, who make it possible for us to present events like this free of charge. And thanks also to our government sponsors, the Government of Canada, the Canada Council for the Arts, the BC Government, the BC Arts Council, the City of Vancouver, and CMHC Granville Island. And just a reminder that the Vancouver Writers Fest presents year round events and updates on those can always be found on our website. Mark your calendars for these inside events every other Wednesday night through until the beginning of June. On May 4th, I'm very pleased to say we are returning to in person inside events at the Vancouver Public Library in the Alice Mackay room. Those will also be streamed for those of you who wish to stay at home or who are not in Vancouver. So you'll get the best of both worlds. And I'm really happy to say that that event will feature Globe and Mail Western Arts correspondent and debut author Marsha Lederman in conversation with Catherine Gretzinger about Marsha's amazing new memoir, Kiss the Red Stairs, which is going on sale in early May. So you won't want to miss that. We will also be hosting a couple of special events coming up. So like I said, check our website. News on those will be coming soon. And now on to our event. Uh, I connected with this book from the moment that I read the introduction where Jen and Stacy talked about the need for a collection of stories um, that related to different experiences, not about having it all or being a great mom, but rather more acknowledging and accepting the real challenges to stay passionate about the work that you're doing while also caring for the small people in your lives. Um, it takes a great amount of care and understanding from one's community and from yourself to make that a possibility. And at any rate, it's a great collection of essays for some, from some really remarkable authors 
from right across Canada, and we're very fortunate to have a few of them here with us tonight. The book, by the way, goes on sale at the beginning of May. You can pre-order it now. It might even be in some bookstores already, so go out and grab a copy. Great Mother's Day gift. Great, great Mother's Day gift. Our moderator tonight, as I said, is Jen Suk Fung Lee, who joins us tonight from Burnaby, BC, where she is, in fact, a good mom on paper and off paper as well. Her books include the conjoined nominated for inter the International Dublin Literary Award and a finalist for the Ethel Wilson Fiction Prize, The Better Mother, a finalist for the City of Vancouver Book Award, The End of East, and The Shadow List, as well as a wonderful children's book called Finding Home, which came out just last year. Jen acquires and edits books for ECW Press, and she also co-hosts the literary podcast Can't Lit. I'm going to turn it over to her now. Thank you, Leslie. Um, if you look at my Twitter bio, I think it says I'm a mostly adequate mother. I don't know if I would say good, good mom quite yet. <laughs> Anyway, I am Jen Sokong Lee. Thank you, everybody, for joining us and uh, for this event, Creativity and Motherhood, with um, three of my very favorites, Stacey May Fowles, Kellyanne, and Yonina Kirtan. Um, so what we're going to do is I'm going to introduce each of these uh, fine authors slash editors, um, and they will do a little reading. I'm going to introduce Stacey May first, because she is my co-editor in this venture, and um, she gets to answer one question from me. I'm, I'm being strict on time here. So um, let me tell you all about Stacey May Fowles. Uh, Stacey May Fowles is an award-winning journalist, essayist, and author of four books. Her bylines include The Globe and Mail, The National Post, Reader's Digest, Elle Canada, Toronto Life, The Walrus, BuzzFeed, Vice, Hazlitt, Quill and Choir, and others. Her most recent book, Baseball Life Advice, was published in 2017 was a national bestseller and was selected by the Globe and Mail and Maisonneuve as the best book of the year. Stacey May lives in Toronto with her husband and daughter where she is working on a children's book and her fourth novel. So everybody, my good friend and colleague, Stacey May Fowles. Hi, Jen. <laughs> Hi, Stacey May. Isn't Who's... this so nice? I'm so excited. <laughs> this is so nice. It's like we're in the same room almost. It's like uh, we're in the same room, yeah. And we both have a copy of the book. See, we're we do. Yeah, <laughs> we've become the same person. I have a question for you. I believe this was Stacey May's idea, "Good Mom on Paper," in the very beginning. And I want to know why you thought an an anthology about creativity and motherhood was needed. It's a big question. That is a big question, and I mean, there's a long answer to that and a short answer to that. But I think the long-ish answer is that um, I was really frustrated and I and I think that this book is sort of born more out of our relationship and our discussions around um, I became a new mom um, I became pregnant in the middle of promoting a book um, <laughs> and and I became a new mom um, while promoting another book and I became very frustrated with how difficult it was to be a literary mom and I think that you know I already had a professional relationship with you we'd worked on a book together and I just sort of came to you for help I think very consistently I have and, all the answers nobody knows this <laughs> well and you know I, I said Jen you know you're much further down this path than me I said Jen I don't know how to write I don't know how to do media appearances with a baby. I don't know how to do any of these things. And we would get on the phone and complain. <laughs> um, and then I think as we are wont to do, the two of us, we were like, let's do a creative project out of this difficulty. And that's sort of how this came to be, I think. Um, and, you know, like the projects we've done together in the past, it's sort of been, we had this idea and then we got out of the way and all of these really beautiful, amazing writers came with all of these incredible stories. And, you know, I, I, I hate to, you know, reveal, but I mean, it was very little to do with us. It's all their talent and genius, right? So I think the very simple answer to your question is that um, we, we were very, frustrated with the reality and instead of stewing we wanted to create something beautiful and we did 
well, yeah, I guess we were we were just the people who kind of shepherded it together. It wasn't like everybody else created something. Um, and I and I want to like the conversation I remember most in the very beginning um, was when you said to me, "I don't, I can't write, Jen. Like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. When am I going to start writing again?" And I think I said, "Oh, I didn't write for two years. It's fine. You're fine." <laughs> and then I remember, I remember, like at the end of my two years, I messaged you and I was like, Jed, I can write again. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, but I, it's, it, I feel like the, the way I got through that time period was via other mothers and their honesty with me and their support in tangible ways and emotional ways and spiritual ways. And, um, this book is, so, is sort of a, book version of that support. Um, there's all of these mothers sharing these incredible stories. And I feel like if I had had this book in that very vulnerable time, it would have helped me so much. Even just another mother who is a creator saying to me, there's going to be a time period where you are not going to be able to be the person you were. And that's okay. And you will come back to yourself. And having you saying that to me made all the difference when there was all of this other pressure to go back to the way things were before, which was impossible. It was entirely impossible for me. So I think this book is kind of like that, you know, outstretched hand to people when they are facing that incredibly difficult, challenging, transformative time. Mm -hmm. And that the, those periods of transformation too, there's uh, lots of our authors are writing about when their children are adults or older too, because things happen, life evolves, and we have different periods in our lives where creativity is difficult, really difficult. Uh, and mm -hmm. yeah, so like, you know, there's the new mom stuff, but there's also like other stuff in this book too. For people. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's not, it's not limited to those difficult baby times. It's, it's definitely a much more expansive um, picture of what the reality is like. I just wrote an email to Stacey May this morning that said my house smells like preteen feet. So that's a whole other, <laughs> don't know if I want to write in that, in that, uh, cloud is all I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's very, it's very, yeah. And there, I, I mean that the, this book in some ways feels like those very candid conversations, right. That, you know, are not, not always acceptable that are not always the things we talk about when we talk about what motherhood means. Um, it feels like a, a really sort of, it, you know, an intimate conversation with a friend. Um, yeah, it's, I'm, I'm, I feel unbelievably blessed to have been a part of this. And again, I'll say it really, it was just a matter of us forming the idea, pitching the book and then getting out of the way. Yeah. Um, uh, speaking of getting out of the way, I am going, I love to, to get out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> I could have asked Stacey May to get out of the way. Um, and I'm going to introduce Yonina Curtin and she is going to do a little reading for us. So everybody. Uh, Yonina Kirtan is a Red River Métis Icelandic poet. She graduated from Simon Fraser University's Writer's Studio in 2007, where she is now an instructor, and where I got to work with Yonina for a couple of years, which is pretty great. Her first collection of poetry, Page as Bone, Ink as Blood, was released in 2015. A late blooming poet, I like the way you put that, she was 61 when she received the 2016 Vancouver Mayor's Arts Award for an Emerging Artist in the Literary Arts category. Her second collection, An Honest Woman, was a finalist in the 2018 Dorothy Livesey Poetry Prize. And her third book, Standing in a River of Time, which I think just came out like yesterday, <laughs> uh, is again coming out right now with Town Books. So it's fresh with a beautiful cover, I might add. Um, so everybody, please welcome Yonina Kiriton. Oh, there I am doing the... <laughs> Forgetting the mic. Thank you so much. Wow, um, as I listened to all of that, I was thinking that about the fact that my piece doesn't speak very much directly to the being a mother in writing. It's actually covering a period before I was a mother um, and it is why I write about some things. So I wanna offer a bit of a trigger warning though. Um, there is uh, some trauma in this piece. And for that purpose, I have put flowers over behind me there and lit a candle for all of the domestic abuse survivors. It's called The Turning of the Wheel. I sit in the board meeting before me, the privileged hold court. One of them is my manager who lives just down the street from me in a fully restored character home. 
My son and I are basement dwellers, renters of the space no one else wants to live in. I've just left him at Bayview School where he is enrolled in kindergarten. It is not the usual pleasant walk to school. There was an incident, not the first, but one of the worst. And now I sit in this board meeting wearing my one good sweater, a cream colored turtleneck, a little too warm for this time of year, but it's all I have. I hope no one notices my flushed cheeks. My back feels damp. I pray it's not blood. I excuse myself and in the washroom mirror, I see that it is. I return to my seat, put on my coat and pray. My son is in therapy now. At 29, he is filled with questions. I tell him he can ask me anything. He doesn't remember the day I dragged him to school after Dean had thrown me, catching my back on the edge of the coffee table. He doesn't remember the last time we saw Dean or that he had hidden in the bathroom, afraid that Dean was going to kill me and then kill him. He had locked the door, sat on the floor and waited. He doesn't remember speaking to the police officer who helped us after my son told them what he had seen. I'm afraid his therapist will turn him against me. I am afraid that 24 years of sobriety will not be enough. I was going to be a better mother, a better mother than my mother. I was not going to tolerate the chaos that a man might bring into my home. I was going to raise my son alone, but I got lonely. I did not know that a child tethers you to home and that going to meetings would become impossible. I did not know many things. All I knew was I wanted to be a mother. I know how it feels to disappear, to be the child in the background of your parents' life. I should have known better. I am afraid his therapist will turn him against me. I'm afraid that 24 years of sobriety will not be enough. I want to remind him of the good, but that is not what's needed now. I want to tell him I am sorry, but I have done that. How many times can you say you're sorry? He hates how many times we moved, all those schools. He says he doesn't have ADHD, HD, and I see all those years of effort crumbling. Monthly visits to the child psychiatrist, all the books I read, and my interventions with his teachers erased. I'm afraid his therapist will turn him against me. I'm afraid that 24 years of sobriety will not be enough. He has been listening to podcasts, asked me if I know who Gabor Mate is, and I want to tell him how angry Gabor made me when it felt like he was blaming mothers for not being the calm, peace-filled bodies their children needed. Instead, I say yes, ask why. I want my son to know why I chose to have him on my own. I mention toxic masculinity and I can feel the very thing I always feared is forming in his gut. It is growing tentacles that wander between us. He has no father because I wanted to protect him and in the end, I hurt him. He had no father to turn to. And then when I was three, I was, when he was three, I was lonely. There was a hole he could not fill. It was a hole that grew large in the night. Can my son understand the fear that grows in a woman's belly? Could he possibly understand how vulnerable I had made myself a woman alone with a child? Will he remember how hard I tried, all that I did? I'm afraid his therapist will turn him against me. I'm afraid that 24 years of sobriety will not be enough. I try to write about our first three years. There is a before and after to our shared story, before Dean and after Dean, before fibromyalgia and after fibromyalgia. I want to tell him how hard I tried, all that I did. I want to know if this therapist understands the world I was born into, a mixed race child, born to an alcoholic father and a compliant mother. I want to know if she knows about racism, sexism and poverty. Does she know about systemic barriers or will she be like my therapist who had seemed to blame my parents? I want to know that he and I will be okay. 
we are okay. And I do have his permission to share this. I would never share anything like this without his permission. And I'll close, I have a little poem at the end. This piece, original piece is called Turning of the Wheel. The poem is called Samsara and has four parts. I'll go one, two, one. Mother, I have lost my place. It is dark here, mother. Without you, the earth is damp, made thin by loss. I am cold, in need of shelter, too. I have a son now, mother. He swims within me. I must build a fire, light the way for your return, three. He cautions me in the kitchen where I'm angry. His small finger pointing, he says, I used to be your mother, four. I hear a cry, he has touched a hot iron, his lips pouting, and he has that why would that thing want to hurt me look. I scoop him up, rush to the rocking chair where I cradle him while he cries. That was until he paused to say, your mother never did this, did she? How does he know this? Was he a toddler remembering another life? I do not know, but he was always reminding me that he is not just the child that the wheel turns. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yonina. It's such a joy to hear you read from this essay that I lived with for so long <laughs> and I love it. So thank you so much. And I, I wanted to say that what your essay always reminds me of is that creativity, just like motherhood, doesn't exist in a vacuum. That there is so much that has to go into a life uh, to build a foundation for the life and to support that life in order for motherhood and creativity to flourish, uh, both individually and together. So um, thank you. And I say this all the time, Yonina has the best voice, reading voice in the business. <laughs> you're so kind. Thank you for all your editing. Thank you. I just get out of the way, as Daisy May says. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to introduce Kelly Yan now, and um, she will also read a little bit. And so everybody, Kelly Yan is a writer of Chinese descent and Caribbean heritage based in the traditional and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. A graduate of the University of British Columbia's MFA in creative writing, her writing has appeared in Geist, Grain, Witness, Poetry is Dead, The Oddments Tray, and Making Room, 40 Years of Room Magazine. She's also created and collaborated on work for live and digital performance, including Rishi and doing, uh, I don't know if I said that right, an audio play for young audiences. I forgot to check the pronunciations on titles, but everybody please welcome Kelly Yan. Hi Jen, thank you Hi. very much <laughs> for the kind introduction. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. And um, yeah, thank you to the VPL and the Vancouver Writers Fest for having this event. And uh, thanks to everyone involved in Good Mom on Paper, Jen, Stacey May, Hazel and Jay at Book Hug and all the contributors. It's a um, real delight to be a part of it. So I'm going to read a section um, of my essay, uh, which is called, uh, What Have You Done Today? And I'm gonna move uh, further in, not the beginning, just to mix it up. Just uh, so, uh, here we go. Before I had kids, I vowed that I wouldn't let motherhood change me. But the babies came along and they wreaked their havoc, not just on my body, but on my brain. Thanks to that change in gray matter, I now spend a disproportionate amount of time feeling bad about what I'm not doing. This guilt occurs regularly, most often expressed in a stream of consciousness downward spiral that my husband refers to as my homage to Lucy Ellman's Duck's new report. The fact that I can't be a good writer if I don't dedicate more time to it. The fact that I don't have time before my board meeting. The fact that the kids need to finish their Valentine's Day cards. The fact that no one will want to publish my book even if I finish it, I probably won't finish it. The fact the roast won't defrost in time. The fact that I forgot to take the roast out of the freezer. The fact that I don't have enough time to write. The fact that I can't write when I have time and, and the clock in the kitchen has stopped. Why do I even bother is a standard coda. My husband waits for me to utter this closing line before he responds in his usual rational fashion. You wouldn't feel so guilty about it if you didn't want to do it. That much is true. The need to write persists as does the desire to be a good mother. The solitary exercise of writing has always appealed to my introversion, the opportunity to be alone, but also in a world of my own making. It's a lot like tackling a jigsaw puzzle. Both can be an exercise in frustration, given the inevitable stalls and in progress and hours spent staring at the holes in the scenes. 
But as a mother juggling a mental laundry list of tasks and the burden of emotional labor, there's no greater feeling than figuring out how all the pieces fit together. To know that my brain still has space to make sense of chaos and for the moment to control it. My husband is sympathetic to my cause and will offer to morph into his parenting superhero alter ego, fun dad, and get the kids out of my hair for a few hours. The kids love this arrangement because they know they're going to get treats. No mission with fun dad is complete without a stop for ice cream or McDonald's drive through and this is after going swimming or sledding or horseback riding or whatever delightful activity he fabs up that day. Fun dad's superpower is big time childhood memory making. Fun dad will text photos to me while they're away, practically live tweeting what they're doing without me so that I won't feel, feel left out. I'll type various heart emojis in reply while the regret takes hold. He'll ask how the writing is going, and that's when I'll send him a thumbs up, even if I've spent most of the time doing a deep dive on YouTube cooking videos. Among the most instructive is a series where a chef attempts to cook a three course meal using random tools and devices. Watching this woman wrestle with frying blini on a hair straightener can only help to inform how my protagonist might deal with similar adversity. Because if said protagonist was lost in the woods and needed to melt chocolate buttons on her cell phone battery to survive, I'd have to know the MacGyver style mechanics to make the scene believable. So I'd have to do the research. So I have to watch the videos. Besides, I don't even own a flat iron. When the three of them return home and we gather for a meal and a debrief, I'll brace myself for impact. What have you done today? I'll ask my kids, even though I have a sneaking suspicion of what their answer will be. They'll say that they've had the best day ever and fun dad's reign as favorite parent remains secure for another day. The family dinner is supposed to boost the spirit and health of everyone involved, not just the kids, but the adults as well. But in these moments, any writing accomplishment is undone and all I feel is guilt. Writing guilt and mothering guilt that gnawing reminder that when you've made time for one thing, you've forsaken the other. Writing 500 words a day may not keep my children alive, but the attempt to make those words count helps me keep me going. Writing is a reprieve from my obligations when I'm not someone's mother or colleague or spouse. A moment to unspool some bit of story from the periphery of my gray matter and bring that part of myself back into view. Would I love to publish a best-selling book and win a bunch of literary prizes? Of course, but that end game is hardly in consideration. For now, writing time is borrowed time. So when the kids are tucked in their beds or I have a lull between meetings or laundry cycles, I'll sit at the little desk in our office and try to write. The desk is usually cluttered with the ephemera of this life, the puzzle pieces and coffee cups, permission slips and spreadsheets, a lucky cat waving its golden arm, hopeful and steadfast. In the corner sits a miniature cactus that seems squishier and sadder than it should be. I should probably send it to the compost heap, but I'm sucker for the visual allegory. Like writing, it will bloom again under the right conditions. Just give it some light and time and good things might happen. 500 words a day will add up. They'll form sentences that form scenes that will grow into chapters. Then eventually there will be a completed manuscript accompanied by the feeling of relief and the smallest allowance of pride. I won't know what will become of the novel if it will make its way out into the world. All I'll know is that I made it to the finish line and I'll claim this as a victory, however fleeting. I'm already looking forward to that dinner when it happens. And who knows, with a little more time and a little less YouTube, it could be soon. The four of us will be seated around the table, eating and playing our game. Someone will ask me what I've accomplished that day and I'll finally have something momentous to report. I can imagine their reactions now. My daughter will request to read the book. Fun dad will throw a high five my way and propose a toast. And my son, ever the pragmatist, will stare at me with a straight face and say, okay, so what are you going to do now? And that's it, thank you so much. Uh, fun dad is, is, I love him, but I also resent him, is, <laughs> which, which I'm sure. That's fair. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hey. uh, thank you so much, Kelly. Like, I remember reading that and I'm like, oh, fun dad gets to do all the good stuff, gets to be called fun dad. Um, poor Kelly is writing amidst a sea of permission slips. Um, anyway, thank you so much for that. Um, so we're all going to have like a little chat. And like if Yonina and Stacy may want to come back. Uh, one of the things that uh, occurs to me about like creativity and motherhood is that their creativity and motherhood are so intrinsically linked together. 
um, in a sense, in a way that they can't be separated. And I don't think that's true for fatherhood and creativity. I think um, there are a lot of creative men out there. I couldn't even tell you if they have children. <laughs> I have no idea. And um, so I think that there is this sort of like braiding of our identities in that way and that creativity changes who we are as mothers and motherhood changes who we are as artists and writers. Um, so how has that been for you? Like, uh, Yonina, how has that been for you? How has creativity and motherhood changed each other? Oh, I love this question. Um, my son was 14 when I began writing. And, uh, and I also then uh, adopted my nephew, who was also 14. So I had two teenagers trying to begin as a writer at 50. That was not easy. But creativity was always part of my life. I just um, have that spirit. I think that most of us who are creative, we're always creative. And I remember my son complaining about uh, how I just wouldn't do things the normal way, no matter what, and including the cakewalk, you know, mom, why can't you just be like the other mothers and just make a cake? Because <laughs> I was thinking of other things we might be able to do. So uh, I think that my son has a hard time um, seeing me and understanding me until lately. So here he's just turning 30. So until now, his mom's been kind of like this weird woman who goes into her room, who reads a lot, who seems to know a lot of people and does all this writing, but it didn't mean much to him. But now on this third book, he came to the last launch and um, he's beginning to see that, uh, that it's something. But I do feel I've neglected him in order to write. I think that it's almost impossible not to, and he still needs me, he's 30 years old, he calls me almost every day, right? So how do we carve that space out? How do we take care of ourselves and our writing spirit? Because I don't know what I'd do if I didn't write. I think I'd explode and something bad would happen to me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, you, Nina. Kelly, what about you? How is those two, the twin identities? marked each other oh I was uh thinking about like sort of those that compartmentalization you know being a mother and being a writer and how they don't always feel easily uh that they work together um very often uh and I was recently watching Severance on Apple TV I could bring that up I hope I'm not spoiling anything for anyone who hasn't watched it yet but I uh, uh, you know, the simple premise of having your two brains, like, like electing to separate yourself um, to your, in your work self and your non-work self and uh, how maybe that was, seems a bit advantageous, but then I realized that the two can't, can't be siloed like that. And so, uh, yeah, it's just sort of, it's the, the management of those two roles. And uh, some days it is that you have to lean more heavily on one side than the other. And I, I mean, I struggle with that every day, you know, and it's like, if I'm not, you know, spending time with my kids for writing, you know, is that, you know, like Yonina mentioned the, the word neglect. It's like, you know, what are you putting aside then in, the, in that moment? Just trying to figure out how, how to make that fair to, to, to everyone, including yourself in your writing practice. I think it's a very like particular um, motherly thing to think about how to make it fair for everybody. Like, I, I, I don't know that, um, you know, every mom I know, well, maybe there's a couple who wouldn't think about that, but I think most moms I know really do think about how to make this relationship with our like art equitable for their children and whoever else is in their lives, whether it's partners or, you know, chosen family or whatever. Um, and I think it so speaks to how we think motherhood is or should be that we think about that, that, that that's something that matters to us. Um, something like Stacy May and I were are emailing back and forth about this book a bit lately. And one of the things we, we both landed on was that uh, having children and being forced to create, <laughs> being forced, having children <laughs> and being called to create uh, can, has opened up an avenue of writing for us that may not have existed before. And like, I know for me, and um, Stacey May can correct me, I'm, I don't want to speak like for her, but I think we both agreed that it opens up a sort of form of messiness or, or open heartedness in our writing that didn't exist before. Is that right, Stacey? Is that what we're yeah, talking? no, absolutely. Because I, I mean, I, I used to be a polisher of prose. Mm -hmm. I used to just spend hours and hours on small chunks and rework and, re 
And now it's just got to go out the door because I don't have the luxury of space and time to be able to get things done. Um, it's, it's, I, I love Kelly that you talk about writing guilt because I, I often think about how when I was preparing to have a child, I heard a lot of things about mom guilt, right? Mom guilt is a thing we talk about, but I was totally unprepared for how guilty I would feel when I was not writing um, and not producing and the sheer jealousy that overcame <laughs> me for people who had the space to write, you know, and, and even like people I love, who are like, I'm going to a retreat or I'm checking myself into a hotel. And, and I would just be like enraged <laughs> because I wanted that space. Um, and, and I feel like that's something I understood that I would feel bad being away from my child, but I didn't understand how bad I would feel being away from writing. Um, and I think that's something we very rarely talk about. Yeah. Uh. Do you, do either of you, Yonina or Kelly ever feel that kind of jealousy? Like I, I know, like, for example, if you're like on social media and someone complains about writer's block and I'm like, I wish I had the time for writer's block. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, I have fibromyalgia, so I don't get to go do a lot of things that people are doing. And I have to regularly deal with my feelings of uh, envy. The word is envy, according to Brene Brown. <laughs> I just list, finished listening to her. So I am envious uh, at times of people and also economically, you know, uh, this is, I'm here trying to figure out how to make my place look good. This is a little one bedroom <laughs> place. My husband's in the bedroom, you know, um, I got a sign on the door, do not disturb because it's in a senior's building. You just never know. Somebody might knock on the door. <laughs> so I am envious at times of uh, what others have, but at the same time, I have to say that I am so grateful for what I do have, like absolutely hundred percent, like hands down, you know, and maybe it's what fuels my writing. I think it gives me heart and um, understanding of things that maybe some people need to hear, hear about. Yeah, for sure. Kelly, what about your rage? Oh yeah. Just kind of sometimes package it up and put it to the side so it doesn't really get the best of you but yeah there's always that frustration of um having like yeah even the, the not just the mental and emotional space but the physical space to be somewhere by yourself to write uh and uh it's that does seem very luxurious to me at times I mean when I you know I I write when the kids are at school or something like that like it is they are physically out of the house but it, it always that feels like such stolen borrowed time a lot and that you're cheating on other a lot of other things too so um yeah just trying to um realize that everyone you know writes in their different circumstances and uh you know we all we all figure out some point even though sometimes you do want to just shake your fists a little bit and maybe scream out into the into the void <laughs> You both are so calm. I, I, I truly, I, I need yeah. to learn. Like how this. you said you both are so, like, you're, 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 you're <laughs> Oh, not Stacey May, just Yonina and Kelly. It's years of practice. <laughs> I've been like, at this I, a very I, long time. I, I, I just want to quickly say that teenagers make it no easier. I have, oh, thought, I'm... I have thought, oh, this is just going to be my time. It's still not my time, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I was uh I was going to ask like how do you think the that motherhood has what do you think motherhood has done to sort of like the craft of your writing like what has it done to the form of your writing or the things that you write about or or even that because I do think that like for example like for me um the conjoined my last novel which was about you know foster care and social workers and you know missing uh, children and stuff I would not have written if I wasn't a mom I don't think I could have so like I, I'm just curious like if you've had what do you think you know motherhood has done to the way that you write or what you choose to write Both look amazing. <laughs> you know that's I don't have a before uh uh, writing. I didn't write before I was a mother. I was a mother when I was 37. I'm 67 now. Um, but I do think that it informs my writing. There's no question. 
that having been a mother, having had that experience changed me. I feel um, I, I've, once that mother sort of instinct was in, ignited. So I had my nephew come live with me after his parents passed away and I took care of him and I got another chosen daughter. And, you know, I would still be collecting kids if I was healthy. I don't know. <laughs> and I, they do show up in the writing and they are part of the writing. My one chosen daughter is a poet as well, Zofia Rose Majay. <laughs> so what can I say? <laughs> You're just creating writers is what you're doing. <laughs> I birthed a writer, not, not physically, but. <laughs> Kelly, what about you? Um, I would say, I think that having kids has made me a little more sentimental in my writing in terms like just accessing that part of myself that I don't think I usually access. And, you know, I, I think I was before trying to write things that were, um, yeah, like what Stacey said, like more polished and, and sharp and, uh, and, and maybe more intellectual than I had any right to be writing about, you know, just kind of like sound. <laughs> uh, but so I think that, that I, I think they may have made me more vulnerable than I think that I ever was before. And that, that sort of translates into the writing. I think, so. I think uh, motherhood really does bring sort of like gets us very in touch with our deepest feelings that we probably would have buried under like irony and coolness when we were younger. And I, and you know, like, as you were talking, I was thinking about the sentimentality part and like, I can hear a pink song and start crying like pink. Some like, days. Like, yeah. Yeah. For me, me, it's the, wrong the Muppets. Hour. For me, it's the Muppets. See? I see the Muppets now and I just cry. And musicals, I can't watch I, musicals. I'm with you, Stacey May. I hear that. In, in mm. Canto, I watched the entirety, like just wept all the way through it at parts that weren't even sad. Like, and it's, I, I feel like it's, it's, I've just embraced this earnest part of myself that I was suppressing before because it was not cool to be earnest about things. And now I'm just like completely open in a way that, you know, comes out in the writing, right? It's, there's, it, it's exactly what Jed says. Like, there's no being cool anymore. It, whatever I was feigning before is gone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. So, um, this is for, I think, people who are watching this now. And I know this is a question that is maybe on people's minds. What is your best advice for a mother who's trying to manage her creative life along with her family life? What would you say? I think I would say, I'll just start. Um, do what feels good. And if it doesn't feel good, you got to stop. Yeah. Yeah. I would say let go of guilt as, as best mm -hmm. you can on all fronts. Uh, being a mother is loaded with guilt from start to finish. It just seems, and people have an opinion. It's, it was amazing to me to find out that people had opinions about your child, how you were raising your child. Strangers had opinions, <laughs> you know, it was like, what? And so just let those people go. They do, they're not living your life. And, you know, if you have a good relationship with your child and they see you busy, happy, working, creative, you know, I think it's good for them. Just like my son saw me reading all the time. He loves to read. You know, I think that it's just good for them to see us that way. And, and um, yeah, and just love them as much as you can. Do spend as much time as you can. I spend as much time as I humanly possible, even though I was working uh, with my son, I just really felt it was important. You don't get that back. Your writing will be waiting. It'll be there if you don't have time to do that. Mm -hmm. That's good advice. Kelly. Yeah, just be kinder to yourself. <laughs> so, you know, you do what you can when you can. And I think it it's just adds to any kind of, unnecessary anxiety to um, really bang your head you know, against the wall and, and wonder why you're not doing more or doing better or whatever that means um, in, in terms of writing or even parenting at the same time. You know, like we all, like you know, saying like there's so much guilt there. So it's like just being able to release that. I mean, I, I should take my own advice in that moment, but yeah, so there's always that, even if you say it, you know, can you, can you do it and, but, I don't, I don't know if there's any other way to get around it because there's always going to be that push and pull that uh, will come along with being a parent and a writer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Stacey May, what do you think? 
I, I mean, I love this idea of letting go because I think that one of the greatest harms I caused myself early on was holding very tightly to things that no longer worked. Um, and I have this memory of myself, you know, five weeks postpartum doing an audiobook recording in studio in like a depends and like I could barely walk and and because you know I did, had not the greatest birth experience and and I was just so determined to be you know the person I was before that I was harm harming myself basically and and that I think there is you know we we tell people that if you're not if you're not bouncing back in all ways, then you have failed in, in some way. And I, I, I would just say you can let go of those things. Those things do not matter more than your well-being and the well-being of this person in your life that you love, right? It's just, they're so irrelevant compared, like you don't need to do the audiobook recording. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> And I mean, my, we were talking before my experience was, I mean, I was covering sports a great deal before I had my daughter. And when you're like the sole um, food source for a person, you can't, you know, cover a three hour baseball game in, you know, at the stadium, it's just not possible. And I think I was really hard on myself um, because I wasn't the person I was before. And I, I just would encourage everybody to let go and make room for something new. Um, that, that was huge for me. It's, I mean, and I know some people, they do, they do bounce back or, you know, I hate that term, but they do, but I don't think it's possible for everybody. And that's okay. That's it's okay to make room and transform. Right. That's, yeah, I am also my best advice is stay away from Instagram mommy influence because they're just going to make you feel bad, very bad. <laughs> um, we're going to go to some questions from the people who are watching and I think they're putting the you guys are putting your um, questions in the YouTube chat function. I, do, I can't see it, so I don't know, but that's what I'm assuming. But we have a question here from Donnie. Um, it must be so hard to compartmentalize your time. Do any of you use a notepad in your purse or bedside table or phone to jot down or record ideas during your regular day? I love these like practical mm -hmm. questions. I use my phone, but- I also use my phone, yeah. yeah. But I usually, when I go back to the notes, they're totally nonsensical. That's <laughs> I've always kept a little notebook with me for years and years and just jotted things down, uh, even have to pull over while I'm driving sometimes because something comes to you, right? So you pull over, jot it down. Now I do use the phone. It's a little bit easier. It's always with me. It's not an extra thing to carry. <laughs> yeah. What about you, Kelly? Also uh, phone notes, although like Stacey, I think when sometimes it all ends up in like the header font. <laughs> <laughs> yes. and it really just like screams at you next time you open a document but yeah handy to, to keep those things straight I had uh I I use the notes function right on my phone and I I, I sometimes I look at them because I forget that I wrote something into it and then I looked at one a while ago and it said um fire at the clown college and I, <laughs> <laughs> I thought is that a novel do, do I want to make it into a novel? And then I had this idea that there's this fire and that all these clouds are stuffed into a tiny fire truck and they all have to get out. And there's the one cloud with the flower on the lapel that just squirts water. In the fire. It doesn't matter. It was, I'm not writing it. It's just, that's what was in my mind. It'd be a great kid's book. <laughs> oh, I should make that into a kid's book. Oh, there you go. There it was. It was there the whole time. <laughs> It just writes itself. Um, so this is a question from Danica. Um, Freud apparently said something about parenthood being the death of the self. Well, that's Ooh. grim. Um, how do I? How Thanks, do I? Freud. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Harshing our buzz. How do identities as parent and as writer artist compete and interact with each other? Did any of you struggle with your sense of self? as a writer during your parenting journey or did you struggle with your identity as a parent? 
uh, along your writing slash artist journey, I, you know, just real quick, I would say all of those things, you know, you really do. <laughs> all of those things were and continue to be a struggle. I think, you know, um, identity wise, like I, I started writing, you know, really young and uh, it was always how I identified myself. And then when my son was born and I remember I was in final edits for <laughs> the better mother at the time. And um, I got a 10 page revision letter when he was something like three or four weeks old and they wanted a turnaround of like five weeks. And uh, I remember reading it on my laptop and he was in strapped to me in a sling, right? And I just put my head down on the keyboard and started to cry. And I was like, I can't do it. Like I'm not sleeping, he, he's not sleeping. Um, and so that very much, I think during that period I was mourning the loss of that writerly identity, which was I think like 80% of how I identified myself. This was really what I clung to. And then making room for the mother identity was a challenge. Um, but I say this to my child all the time. Like, I don't like all kids, but I like my kid. And <laughs> so I was willing to do that for him. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else? Um, I, I think part of the struggle, I think it's important to acknowledge that part of the struggle is because of these like pervasive overarching beliefs of who gets to be a writer and who gets to be an artist and who gets to be creative. And it, it doesn't, you know, in this sort of depiction, it doesn't look like a mother, right? It's always sort of this like lone male, like it's, it, it tends to be, you, you, it, it, becomes difficult to see yourself as the writer when we're not melding those two identities and we're not showing how how the writer can be many things and the and a creative person can be many things. So I, I mean I think part of the reason for even like wanting to do this book was to sort of dismantle those ideas about what you know the great writer looks like right which is it's silly <laughs> it's, I mean writing is sitting at a at a desk or on the floor or in your bed or wherever or on your phone writing words down that's what a writer is it doesn't have to look a certain way and uh, you know I think part of the beauty of this book is it, it it takes apart those ideas those very harmful ideas mm -hmm. yeah you need to know Kelly. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. I was thinking of self. Death. Well, I, and, and it's funny because Jen, you said something to me about like being in the green room of, of writers festivals and, and being just like having these conversations with other mothers mm -hmm. about how they were dealing, but never having that conversation with fathers, right? It was. Nope. Yeah. I remember having a conversation <laughs> with someone who was married to a male author who um, was in a green room with us. Uh, my child was probably about six months old. Hers was maybe one. And they, we were both nursing. And like her husband was just doing what he was doing. And she's got her boob hanging out and her shirt <laughs> up. And, and I was like, please let me help you. I have my child here too. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, um, yeah, Yonina or Kelly, any, any thoughts to add to that? Well, I, that death of self really struck me. And um, I was thinking, again, I wasn't writing. I was 30, almost 37, but I was a sports group specialist with Canadian Airlines, which I can't even imagine who that woman was. Where <laughs> did she go? After I had my child, I went back to my job and I could not do my job. I couldn't do it. I didn't have the bandwidth like my brain had turned to mush, but also he was, where was he? <laughs> I, I need him, <laughs> you know, and I'd go at lunch and breastfeed. And, and then when he quit breastfeeding, my heart broke because he was too distracted in the daycare. So I'd go, it didn't work doing that at lunch. So, you know, it really is a death of self. And so from there, that's where the writer came because I started looking at other careers, I started thinking, what else can I do? I started going to school. I'd never been to school. I started working in social justice. And um, yeah, and this is what you got 30 years later. <laughs> well, I like what we got. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, this is an interesting question that I wanted to 
bring up before we end. Um, has anyone, this is from Allie, has anyone had a conversation with their husbands or partners about whether they too are experiencing any form of guilt? Well, I'm not married any longer, so I don't know. <laughs> Who wants to take that on? It's an interesting question though. I don't know if fathers feel the same amount of guilt as mothers. Any thoughts? There's a lot of silence. <laughs> the people with the fun dads in their house yeah. are silent. <laughs> oh. Yeah, it's like he just wins all the time. No, uh, it's, it's uh, yeah, I don't know if they experience the same um, ter turmoil uh, uh, over even really small decisions or what they perceive to be smaller decisions. You know, like not going to soccer practice because it gets you 45 minutes at your computer to do some work. Uh, and then, you know, and they're the other, the parent that's there, uh, you know, or like if you have traded off, who would, would either, who would feel guilty in that situation and be like, oh no, you need to do something for yourself or you need to do work or you need to do what, that's just it. And I think um, that's probably where, we kind of go in different directions where it just, I, I, I always feel that I agonize over making choices uh, in a way that he, he doesn't, he does not. And that, I mean, that's just in our house, but I, I feel like in terms of father versus mother and the guilt piece that maybe is uh, where, uh, yeah, we take different paths. Yeah. That sort of ability to prioritize yourself, like how easily that comes to you. I, it does not come easily to me. It it always feels like when I do it, it's like, it has to be like, I have to be like, I'm going to do this where it, yeah. you know, my partner sort of does it with this grace that I don't have. Right. It's just kind of like, this is a thing I need to do. So yeah. I'm going to do it. Whereas I have to be so definitive and it has to be a big production. Right. <laughs> to be like, um, and, and what does that say about our culture, right? That makes us feel like we have to be so aggressive about carving out time for ourselves. Yeah, I want to like, there's, I'm going to end on this one question from uh, Theodora Armstrong. Hi, Theo, um, which I really like, because I think it's a nice, positive, um, lovely question and uplifting one. She's curious if we can discuss how our writing community could better support mothers who are writers. Oh, that is a good question. Yeah, particularly single mothers and mothers with young children. So yeah, how can we better support that? Um, I know that my dream has always been that there would be a writing residency that in, um, uh, invited people with their children um, and provided daycare. <laughs> That would be great. That, that would be amazing. Number one on my list of things. <laughs> Anyone That's else? Incredible. Well, if it's a financial issue, providing uh, pay, paying for childcare while we go and do things, because you know we're always having often to pay for things like that. Um, yeah, and maybe even providing it, like you know, at a. Wouldn't it be fun if there was a reading that had childcare off to the side, like? holy wow. yes yes like wouldn't that be fantastic <laughs> like yeah, if the I mean, children could have a reading circle with someone yeah. fun yeah so, and, i mean there's funny things like all launches are at bedtime but <laughs> yeah that's true an afternoon launch with the, with the children in their own yeah <laughs> Um, yeah, and, and I know that some granting organizations are starting to include childcare as a budget line, which is, which it seems like such a minor thing, but it's, it's huge because you, you need the space, you need um, that sort of, yeah, it, 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 it's, it's monumental and they are just like really small things. Um, I often think about um, media and how media accommodates writers with children um you know there's you, you do a morning how are you going to do a morning radio hit if you have a small child it's just it's not possible and you know even to just not forget about those writers because those children grow mm -hmm. up right so <laughs> keep, like keep inviting them because at some point it will be possible yeah, like someone phones you and says, Jen, can you come into studio for 7, 10 a.m.? No, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> Kelly, what do you think about how our community could better support writers who are, who are mothers? 
Uh, I, I totally agree with the child care asset. Uh, so that's always been one. Like, and that's usually, you know, when you're tied to, to the home with little ones, you can't get out. And, you know, so it is even just in a more informal way too, if there is just, well, maybe that's it, just more conversation and uh, more honesty about that need that, hey, can you take my kid for a walk in the stroller while I, you know, work for a little bit or, um, you know, come over, have a coffee in the kitchen and, you know, play cards with my child while I do a little work, you know, just it. And it is, I guess, you know, it's finding those people, but I think the right community, there's, uh, it's, there's always those people you can connect with and who are, uh, will be willing to lend a hand as long as we ask for it, I guess, too, and, and keep advocating for that. Yeah. And, and I would say like to organizers and stuff to also ask if someone needs childcare or if they need extra something help that way whenever you're inviting someone to an event um can't hurt to ask if somebody needs something else because that's uh because we often do stacy mm -hmm. did i cut you off no i was just saying thinking child-friendly spaces would be great um i I do, I do feel like one of the the odd things that have come out of the pandemic is that you know people with children have it's more literary cultures become more accessible right like I you know I can attend a launch and you know my my kid is right it's fine right instead of everything was like a big production before and now I feel like you you can be more involved in literary culture with a child in in this sort of setup um, so, you know, to take what we've learned from that and move forward and be more inclusive to people who are parenting. Mm -hmm. Let's not forget about the accessibility things we've all learned over these last two years. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Perfect. I like that. Um, so I think we're going to end there. Um, I want to This was lovely. Wasn't this lovely? It was really lovely. I even brushed my hair for the occasion. Um, I just want to thank Yonina Keratin, Kelly Yan, Stacey Mae Fowles for joining me tonight for, I put my notes in the drawer now, I can't find the creativity and motherhood. <laughs> and um, everybody, this is good mom on paper. We're very and proud thank of you to all of the wonderful contributors in this book for being a part of, you know, such a beautiful project. I feel so lucky to have worked on it. And thank you for your stories. 20 great authors I encourage you to look and see who's there because I bet it you is wanted, a, at least one of your favorites is on that list <laughs> it's a perfect Mother's Day gift yes totally <laughs> oh everyone. and we should say we should say that a portion of the proceeds of this book go to the Mother's Matter Center um Jen do you want to talk a little bit about the Mother's Matter Center? yeah the Mother's Matter Center um supports um mothers who are experiencing barriers with um financial barriers or cultural barriers are feeling isolated um, and they support mothers across Canada um, and help them sort of build a solid foundation for their parenting and their lives. So we're happy to um, help them out with the Good Mom on Paper and they're a great organization. We really believe in them. So And so you get a book and you get to support a great organization. Sure. Yeah. So I'm not sure is Les if Leslie is coming back. I think she is. <laughs> I am. <laughs> Thank you all so much for this tonight. Um, that was, I used the word nourishing in a tweet earlier, and it's kind of a hokey word in some ways, but honestly, that's actually how I feel. So thank you for that. And uh, again, this book is available, if not today, within the next week for sure in your favorite bookstore. So go on out, grab a copy for you, for your mom, for your friends who are moms, for your husband. Find out if he feels the same way. Does he feel that guilt? I, I don't know. I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe. That's another book. Maybe that's another book that Book Hug can tackle. Um, different editor, though. I thank you all so much for being here tonight and um, wishing you all well, wellness and um, wishing you happy spring. Thank you for being here. Happy Mother's Day. It's coming. Thank you. Take care. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.